see you all here to learn about SQL Server on the provider. For those that were late, I did say earlier on, there will be red text in my demos. You're allowed to point out if I do something stupid, but you're also going to see why. Uh, my name is Rob. I am at SQL DBA with Beard. Um, fairly obvious. Uh, my website is sqldbawithabeard.com. Enough of that rubbish. So we're going to talk about some stuff. A what, a how, and then a what. So how many DBAs do we have in the room? Oh, I love you. How many developers? Yep, good. Yeah, some, some shaky hands. And the rest of you are sort of general, amazing, admin-y people, I presume. Yeah? Oh, only one. Only one amazingly admin. The rest of you are just ordinary admin people. No, too late. It's too late. <laughs> cool. So we're going to talk about the SQL Server provider. And what it does is enable you to connect to your SQL servers at the command line. In just the same way as in PowerShell, you can navigate through the registry or the certificate store straight from the command line. You can do the same thing with SQL Server using the SQL Server provider. As we'll see, because all we're doing is making use of SQL Server management objects, it's not just a print-only scenario. This is not a read-only thing. We can take actions and we can do things. So, how do we get it? Up until 10 days ago, not even 10 days ago, the only way to get the SQL Server module, which you require to have the SQL Server provider, was to install the SQL Server Management Studio. If you want to install SQL Server Management Studio, us guys, Chrissy, Aaron, and I from uh, the PASS PowerShell virtual group created a nice short link just to take you straight to the place on MSDN where you can download it. That's not the only way to get it. You can also go and download the particular SMO objects from the SQL Server feature pack and have those. So if you don't want to have that full install of Management Studio, that's another way of doing it. We've created a short link for that as well. You have to install the CLR types. You have to install the shared management objects. And then you have to install the PowerShell extension for Microsoft SQL Server in that order. You can install them in the other order, but then strange stuff happens. Okay. However, now, thank you, Matthew, because I hope you'll listen to this. You can get the SQL Server module straight from the gallery. So as soon as I saw that, that was announced, I dived onto my, I fired up my machine, import module SQL Server. Once I, sorry, install module SQL Server. Once I'd done that, I then went to the gallery to see how many downloads had been. There'd been less than 10. So, yes, results. I'm in quick. It's pure fluke. I happened to wake up at five o'clock in the morning. Um, I then thought I'd better check that my demos work. I ran through this presentation and the demos that you're going to see and they don't work. So we are not running with the SQL Server module from the gallery. Uh, this, all of this demo is running using the SQL Server module that's available with the latest release of SQL Server Management Studio, which is release 17, not the 16, or not one of the release candidates. We're in the latest one. So that's running at version 20. This is version 21.0.3479, I think, something like that. They've changed their numbering system. However, it has some issues. Welcome to PowerShell with SQL. There are issues. So what can I do? If you're working with SQL Server in PowerShell, you can pretty much do anything you want to. However, you can't do everything that you want to. There are some caveats. We're going to talk about the good, and we're going to talk about the bad, and I'm going to show you some of the ugly. There. 
Oh, one person left. So you think the PowerShell party event last night was good? Yeah? You ain't seen nothing on a SQL party. Okay? So tonight, when you're thinking about that, you go and Google or look on Twitter or Facebook for SQL bits, B-I-T-S, and you have a look at the picture of the party and you tell us if we didn't have a really good time. So, let's start. Let's port the module. How do we know if we have our SQL Server provider available? We have our PS Drive. There it is, along with all of our other PS Drives. If I'm talking to SQL guys, I'll go on a lot more about all the other PS Drives, but I'm assuming that all of you guys know about using PowerShell Drives. Yes? Good. Yeah, cool. Lots of nodding faces. So, we can pretend that we're at the command line. So we can DIR, uh, let's go up a little bit. Inside our SQL Server root of our, I'm going to call it a drive for the sake of argument. You can see we've got our DAC data collection, SQL policy, utility, SQL registration, SQL, SSSIS, X event, database X event, and SQL AS. SQL guys, what's missing? Which, part, which component of SQL Server is not available? Um, the agent actually is inside the SQL one, but good spot. Reporting services. Reporting services team have not made reporting services available within the SQL provider. So there's one not so good. We have asked them, we're having a conversation with them about making sure that you know, they, they at least look at it and try and get it in, and they are more hopeful. So it, it will be coming in the, in the future, we hope. So, we're going to dive into registration. And inside there, we've got our central management server group, and we've got a database engine server group. So those are the guys are you, that are using central management server. You can just jump onto that, and you can access it, and you can go through. Those guys who use a registered servers list, then you can have access to that straight away. So let's CD to the database. We'll just tab tab into the we'll just tab into the database engine service group. So you can do it as much as you like, and you're not going to get anything. It does work here. It doesn't work there. Good. Bad. Okay. So, inside here, uh, you need to do that bit, Rob. If we have a look, you know the bit where they say don't type in demos? I'm going to do a lot of typing in demos and I'll make typos and you can laugh. It's cool. All right. So, now we're in our. SQL Server Management PS Provider SQL Server SQL Server SQL Registration Database Engine Server Group. Okay. What we've got is our beard nook. Here is our nook running all of those machines that you saw, and my XPS, which also has an instance on it called Dave. The reason it has an instance called Dave, I had an intern, and I was explaining how you could have different instances on an, on a server, and he couldn't get it. So let's just install one on here. And we got to the point where we named our instance, and I said to him, what should we call it? And he went, uh, Dave. All right, right. It shall be called Dave. And it has stayed forever. So, if we dive into Management Studio, oh, you can see all of the uses I've created there, and look at our register servers, that's, that's what we can see. So we've got a list of SQL servers, and a Linux server, and then XPS and Dave. So, Let's do the same thing here. So if we can CD into beard, <laughs> that's really funny. We CD into beard nug. No, you're going to work. When I do that in code, if I used 
small letters, it won't tab. However, I had to be, it appears to be case sensitive in code and now, as I've now found out, not case sensitive in ISE. So SQL Server on PowerShell, it's a bit weird at times, even more so. So let's have a look at one of our registered servers objects. And as you can see, this is my Linux server. Um, we've got a path, we've got some uh, parent path, we've got connection string. What's the big issue here, especially if you're a DBA? Yes, sir. Plain text password. Okay. Where are we? Data source, Linux, D dummy server, user ID, SA, password. This is a cool weird. You're welcome. So be aware that you're exposing plain text passwords if within your registered servers, when you create a new server in SQL Server Authentication mode, if you tick that box, that password is going to be available in plain text. Your security people might not want you to do that. Just saying. So, just as you'd expect, what we can do is get rid of the one with the plain text password because, you know, I don't want all you guys hacking my dummy Linux server that doesn't exist. Now we can do the things you would expect to be able to do in PowerShell. We can get a list of names. We can ping our servers. So all of a sudden at the command line, I don't have to worry when somebody says, oh, I think all of our servers are down. I have literally had that question from my VMware team. Oh, all the SQL servers, are uh, when we're not sure which ones are available. We think something funny has gone on, can you tell us? Well, what about your monitoring? Yeah, it's not up yet. Okay, we can just do that. As you can see, one of my machines is not available. So people who use SQL or in any way with PowerShell, do you know about DBA Tools module? Yes, who doesn't know about the DBA Tools module? Okay, your, your job from the beard later on is to go to dbatools.io, have a look at the DBA Tools module, realize quite how brilliant and awesome it is, tweet Chrissy Lemaire, at CL, say thank you, and then take it back to your organization and save yourself hours and hours and hours of time. Anybody who has a DBA, who isn't a DBA, who has a DBA back at home, back at work, go back to them and say, are you using the DBA tools module? And then explain to them how much time they can save. So let's have a look. I wanna know how long my estate has been up. I can grab all of my SQL servers. I can make use of my DBA, get DBA uptime. And as we can see, we're getting a load of decent information coming out in outgrid view, straight out of my little look, which is today struggling a little bit. What have we got in all servers? Hey. Uh, oh, of course. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's going to be fun. Um, let's test our latency. I'm going to have to quit all of these because I've got one box that's not going to work. So we can now test our network latency against each of our servers that we've got in our registered service list straight from the command line using the DBA tool. And it's going to time out because that doesn't bring back an object. In version, uh, yeah, in release version 1.0 DBA tools that will be June, it will, um, everything will return an object. We've got 180 something commands. We got 60 so in before we'd really properly formalized what our code should look like and made sure that we were doing things properly. So we've had to do a little bit of work to go back and make sure everything's working. So I'm a DBA, when was my last backup in my estate? And you see how quick that's flicking through. So we can see that I'm not a very good DBA, it appears. 
actually my data center has been offline while it's been traveling around the country. But for every database on every server within my service list, I could see when my last full backup was, when my last differential backup and log and how many days and whether everything's groovy. We've got a last good check DB, make sure our corruption, our databases don't have any corruption. We can do that again straight from the um, command line. But let's dive into the database engine. So I'm going to set my SQL Server variable to my local instance. And if we have a look inside there, there's our two instances, just as you would expect. We have to make sure that we connect to a named instance. So we have to put our default in, or we would have to put Dave in. And within that, we have the things that you would expect to see. Audits, availability groups, credentials, databases, the job server one, so is where the agent, all the, the stuff to do with the agent and jobs and operators live, um, link servers and logins, everything that you would expect to see. Uh, if we just look at a database, we've got some databases on, on the Dave instance. We could do exactly the same just by putting our remote server name on the back. Only see we've got a default instance on 2016 node one. And if we have a look back at our XPS, what we have, SQL Server Management SMO object, server object, which enables us to make use of all the events, all the methods and all the properties that are available in that. And there are hundreds and hundreds of them. You can create um, SQL authenticated PS drives. So if we wanted a PS drive for our SA account on our local SQL server, we need to just make sure that we create a new PS drive with a root in that format and use the PS provider SQL server. It will come up with a prompt. As everybody knows, when you use SQL authentication, your username must match your password, otherwise nothing, nothing works. So I guess more of a laugh at a SQL, in, a, in a SQL conference. And then you can just set your location to your um, account. And if you have a look at the name of your PS drives, you can see you've got, we've got an SA XPS um, PS drive. And now we're logging in using SQL authentication and all the privileges that we expect to get from doing that. Just the same, comes up with a different sort of instance name where we do a get item. Um, so can we connect to Linux servers? You can put SQL Server on Linux now, so surely we'll be able to, oh, okay. Yeah. You can't create a PS drive, you can't use a SQL provider with your Linux servers, unfortunately. To be honest, the best way, if you are programmatically creating an SMO object, you would expect to do, and I did for many years, SRV equals new object Microsoft SQL Server Management SMO server and the server instance name. And that's an awesome way of doing it. However, that just created you a blank object. And it was only when you then started to access some of the properties of the methods that it actually reached out and touched the SQL Server. Which meant that if you fat fingered the name of the instance, you didn't know until you'd written all of your code and started running it that it was going to fail. For DBA tools, we created Connect DBA SQL Server, which does work with Linux boxes. So Rob is an awesome guy. Of course, that's my password. Um, and now, once this goes through, we're going to have a nice SMO object called Linux. once the hamsters have uh, run through the network. Oh. Excellent. Dollar SA, yeah. Uh, anyway, it does, it does work. So, all of my code is available on GitHub. 
If you go to github.com slash, guess what, SQL DBA with a beard, you'll find a presentations repo. Inside the presentations repo is the PSConf 2017, um, what am I doing, SQL, using SQL Server Provider. Um, and that's got all of my code and this presentation. And when I finish this later on, I'll just commit all of the latest things that, that I've done. And what I've made available, if you want to follow along, is a um, little backup. It's only four meg of just a dummy table to make the rest of the demo work. Um, and once you run this, all it's going to do is dive out, download that little file, which has worked really quickly. Come on. We're going to use the restore SQL database command, which has come out of the SQL Server module. And we're not going to connect to the outside world for some reason. Boom. Anybody got, if you just fell for night, got any questions while I, we fall out of here? No, nobody's got any questions. Oh, what a shame. There we go. Right. Let's just do that bit. Ooh. I expected some things to break. I did not expect that one to break. Still there. Good. Da, 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 da. Excellent. So, that works quite well in some ways. Um, the restore SQL database command has failed and it's given us a nice error which says exclusive access could not be obtained because the database is in use. So obviously one of my earlier tests has kept a connection open to that database and now it won't let me restore over the top of it. Completely normal SQL behavior. It's exactly what you'd get if you'd run CSQL in the management studio. Also makes life quite easy. The restore SQL database command enables you to script out. This is just to show the DBAs that there's no scary PowerShell magic weird going on. There's something unbeknown to them they don't understand. You go, no, look, all we're doing is running T-SQL. If you're running PowerShell commands against SQL Server, it's just running T-SQL under the hood. Nothing clever is going on. Well, lots of clever things are going on, but nothing strange that they should be afraid of. So, We can have a look at our databases and what you'll see is all the default properties that are available to you are exactly the things that you would see if you looked in Management Studio and you looked at the databases level and you did, come on. That should have been an F7, <laughs> should have worked there, but you'll just see you're getting exactly the same information as you get in here. And when you're talking to your DBAs, you don't really know PowerShell and they want to know what it is that they can see. If you right click on here and look at the columns, these are pretty much going to be, are going to match up with the property names that they're going, that's going to be available on the SMO object at this point at a database level. And as you navigate through the tree, these are going to be the ones that are available to them. That's the way of seeing what is available to the, them from within PowerShell. So let's set our database and get some more information. So we'll just grab our last backup date. Guess how DBA tools test last backup works? It's exactly like that. It's surrounded by cleverness so that people don't have to work too hard. But inside our databases, we can look at our assemblies, our certificates, our audits, all the defaults, everything that you would want to be able to work with straight at the command line. And it carries on. You can look at your tables. We can see 
how much space has been used. We can see the row count within the table. We can see the index space used and when the table was created. This is all new with the, the latest SQL Server module. Um, some of the improvements that some of the people in the community have uh, put into the SQL Server PowerShell team and asked them to make available. Because this is the sort of information that we want to have available to us nice and quickly at the command line. We can see lots of other objects, but these are the default ones that are available to us. If we look in a table, all the things that you would expect to see, checks and columns, the extended properties, full text index, all the indexes, and our statistics. Keep on navigating down, we can get down to our columns within our table, all from the command line, or we could look at our indexes. When we look at our indexes, we're getting some information about how much space we're using, which file group we're in, what type of index it is, all by default. I think we're missing one column because of the scaling here. So, you know, great, thank you, Beard. We can see stuff. I'd like to be able to see a bit more. So we could, these are just coming out as that's going to be a database SMO object. We can just pull out those particular properties and make use of them. If we have a look at some, if we have a look at our tables and do a bit of formatting, then we can see what we've got exactly the same as we did just now. But that means that we can now make things a bit easier if we're scripting, if as a PowerShell person we're scripting things for our DBAs to make use of, we can now put it up into a nice out grid view. And I like out grid view because we can go, oh, yeah, info doesn't really work so well, let's use databases, and filter nice and quickly. Uh, hopefully I'm going to have time to show you another little neat trick with out grid view. But now we can enable ourselves to have some user choice. Uh, I want to know about that table and that table. Now we're just getting all of the information about just these two tables. So now you can see how you're building up scripts to enable your DBA to get some information about just the tables they're interested in and pass them on in through to something else. I'm sure you guys all know about outgrid view and the pass-through parameter. Yes? Good. You know how to search for properties. We don't need to go through that. And now that we've got our properties, now let's actually start doing something useful. So maybe for compliance, we need the T-SQL for the create for some tables. And because this is a me table, is just an SMO table object, it's got a script method, and what the script method does is generate the T-SQL that it's going to use against the SQL server if you were gonna do a create. So it means that you've got your T-SQL there ready to, for these two tables, ready to do with as you please. So what I find people want to do, well, need to do, are required to do, is to put it out into a file, maybe for some source control, maybe for some compliance, maybe for some auditing, for a timestamp, this is what it looked like at that point in time, for lots of strange reasons that kind of don't make sense in this new DevOps world, but some of, you know, we're still stuck in some, some heavy compliance around data as you would expect. You don't want your data to be out in the outside world without your control. So now we can actually, even better, we can do things like have a look at the statistics that are available on our table. What the statistics do are they enable the SQL engine to make a very good guess at what is available in that table so that it knows which indexes to use to bring your data back to you quicker. So we can see that our DBO instance list um, primary key was last updated on the 27th of December 2016. So if we've made lots of changes to that data and our statistics are right out of date, maybe all of the queries that are making use of that table and that index are now not performing in the most op optimized way. 
And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we can update them. So when we look at our tables, I've updated the database. <laughs> look at my code. Um, if we look at our tables object, we have an update statistics method. So now we can define which uh, tables we want to, which tables statistics we want to update. We can make use of that. So when we go back and we have a look at the, um, <coughs> ah, of course, we have a look at the statistics in the last updated time. It's not actually matching the same time because we didn't uh, use our restore. We need to refresh. Now, part of this is a talk for DBAs because they never, they, they look at this, oh, it's broken, it's not worked properly. And then I remind them in Management Studio, in the GUI that they're used to using, unless you right click and do a refresh, it'll still show you a database that's been deleted because it doesn't know. And actually, because Management Studio is making use of exactly the same objects. So when you right click and press refresh, you're literally, if we did it on a statistics, we would be running exactly that code. So once we refresh and we have a look, and now you can see that it's moved up from when I was doing, running through my demo at the back whilst Jason was speaking, and now we've got the latest date available to us. So we're gonna set our SQL Server into our policies, into Set our SQL Server into a variable, because we're going to need it in a minute. And now we're going to see whether we can CD SQL policies. Thank you. It's not going to work. So let's CD into uh, our 2016 instance. And we'll have a look at our policies. So, um, everybody aware of policy-based management? Yeah, few nodding heads, few not so. Policy-based management is a way of ensuring that certain settings or are as described as you expect them to be, and you can control what happens within your within your instance. So, if, for example, you never want anybody to have a table that starts with the name TBL, because it's obviously a table anyway, then you can put a policy in place to make sure that that is available, that is never going to happen, because you run your policy-based management check against it, and it will come up and say, oh, this has happened. And you can actually stop things from, from happening. So, let's have a look at our policies. Uh, here we go. So I've put in some of the Microsoft best practices policies. So they're making sure that the backup and data file locations are not in the same drive. Uh, they're making sure that database auto close is not turned on and auto shrink is not turned on. Um, and that our collation is matching our server collation. Um, and a whole load of other things. So. So now, of course, this is, you know, LS works. So let's search for all the ones. A SQL space S something. This is precisely what you guys as PowerShell guys would do, yes? <laughs> Hang on a minute. I just saw them. Let's, let's just go back up there. SQL Server, password expiration, max work threads. Okay. Welcome to SQL Server and PowerShell. Sometimes things get a bit weird. You've got to make use of a script block with a where method to be able to do it. I don't know why, but if you want to do it, that's the way you're going to have to do it. So now we can perform some action. So let's run some checks against our um, SQL Server. We're going to check, so for every one, we're going to just uh, put, spit the name out into the host, and then we're going to use the evaluate method with two arguments, check, and that 
SMO server object that we made use of earlier on. And what we have, pretty quickly, is we can see that um, true, 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 SQL Server login mold is, is false, according to these best practices policies that I've imported. And all the other ones above there are running as true. So we can make use of policies right at the command line and move ourselves forward. Does anybody know what time this is supposed to finish? 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Let's, let's speed up a bit then. So let's jump into SSIS. Uh, SSIS integration services. This is the de part of the demo that would not work with the new SQL Server module. This is where it failed. It fails to load the assemblies. There's something going on. I haven't investigated it. But if we have a look in, we can look at our um, SSIS DB. So let's uh, just recurse and have a look through the folders that we've got through there. Oh, no, okay. So you can't do a GCA, a get child item and recurse through the folders that are there. You'd want to, but you can't. So we have to run through and look at our packages like this. So inside our packages folder, we've got a bids are awesome package. And then we can see all of our methods and now we can execute our package. And we just get 43. All right, okay, brilliant. If we have a look at the parameters of our um, package, we can see, and you can see you can access all the parameters within your SSIS package. We can see that we've, we've got our data source, we've got initial catalog, um, password. Oh, good, no password, excellent. And, um, username, all of this stuff is here and available to us to be able to see what's going on at the command line. Now, if we go and have a look at our executions, we'll see that down at the bottom, awesome bids, bids are awesome package is now running. And if we refresh and have another look, it might have finished. No, okay. But obviously we want a little bit more information. Those guys who are used to using SSIS will know that you can go in and grab the reports within Management Studio and see what's going on. So if we have a look in our executions, we then have to go through to messages.messages .messages to be able to come out. So as you can see, what we have is our package and, and the package comes through and it says uh, wash the beard, condition the beard, dry the beard, oil the beard, glitter the beard and then generally be awesome. I've got to be honest, it is far easier to open Management Studio and get those reports than it is to navigate through this and find out what's going on. This probably is not the place to show your DBA or your, your ETL guys who are using SSAS how cool and wonderful PowerShell is when working with SQL. Just saying. Um, so let's have a look at some extended events. Um, we'll dive into the default instance. We'll see what sessions we've got. So we've got our always on health because we've got an availability group, we're always going to have an always on health extended event. We've got our basic trace, that's one that I've created. We've got a system health one at the two, at the, at the bottom. Those ones are enabled. If we have a look at the targets of our extended events, you can see we've got an event file and a ring buffer are against the system health pack, um, extended event. So we can now run against our event file, our get target data, and our out spits a load of XML. Um, if we put it out into an XML file, why are we doing this? Oh, yes, I know. We can then do the following. Oh, yeah, we spit it out to an XML file, you know it's just XML. So you could use, use it that way and then pass it in whatever way you wanted to pass XML, um, where PowerShell is definitely better than SQL. But that's just my opinion. Um, let's just stick the XML um, from our ring buffer into an XML variable. Welcome to confusion with SQL Server. 
If we try to go and locate this file from this path without strongly defining that we're using a file system, we're going to a UNC path, it's going to fail. So we'll just dive back into our file system provider. And then we're going to export everything out and put it into a, C a CSV. Because I've got multiple versions of SQL Server have been installed on this machine, I need to make sure I'm grabbing the right uh, assembly. So that's why we're adding these types here. And now we're going to create ourselves an X event link query table X event data. And it doesn't say queryable X event <laughs> data object. And we're going to look through for some expressions. And for each one of those we find, we're going to pull out some information. Which means that when our availability group fails over, let's stick that out to our grid view. Okay, let's not stick that out to our grid view. When our availability group fails over, I can very quickly use that bit of code to see the message that's displayed here as to what happened when. You know, the, the availability group fails over, the application was not available for a little amount of time, and we want to know what happened, what our timeline was and how it went. I just put that bit of code in a little function and now I can just access it, grab that information nice and quickly, be able to respond back to these questions for people easier, save yourself time, make everything wonderful. So, how long have we got? Yeah, just enough time. Who was it? You. I was just told three. That's okay. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Okay, cool. All having a good time? <laughs> so, I said I'd show you something else about um, using out grid view with SQL Server. Sometimes you get asked to find the information that's in a database table. You might want to know what, whether those email addresses are in there. So for this example, because I'm a bit weird, I decided to have a look in the EventureWorks database, which is the demo database Microsoft provided for enabling us to do stuff and see if my birthday was in there. Oh, where is my birthday going to be in the AdventureWorks database? Oh, first thing we want to do is we want to make sure we have a look at the tables. We'll sort by data space use because probably it's going to be in the biggest table. That's going to have the most data. Let's see what's, what's going on there. Oh, awesome. The biggest table is the person table, likely to have dates of birth in it. Brilliant. And it's got just under 20,000 rows. So let's, because we have a little moment of time, let's grab all the information out of that table. Um, okay, so what have we got in there? Uh, Name, style, uh, first name, middle name, last name, suffix. Did we come by an email promotion? A load of XML, a road GUID. Oh, modified date, okay. Uh, maybe it's in the XML. So we have a look in the XML. Uh, doesn't seem to be awful lot in there. Where is this date of birth? Let's have a look at it in PowerShell. So, we're going to use invoke SQL2, we're going to put it into out grid view. We're going to get all this information. And when we have a look in here at our XML, somewhere in there, we're going to find a date of birth. Now, in SQL, you could pass that XML out from that shred it through, search through for the right value and find out what's going on. In our grid view, you can look for 1971. 
dash 12. Dash 22. <laughs> ah. Look at that. One person in the Adventure Works database, uh, gender F, F is a female, and there's the birth date. 22nd of December, 1971. Yes, I really am that old. I know, you can't believe it, right? And this is Alexandra Hall. But what we've just done is have a look through 20,000 rows of our table in our grid view and filtered it by the values that are available inside the XML, just in a nice, simple little GUI like that. Of course, if you have a huge table, unless you have a machine with a shed load of RAM, it's not going to work. Yeah, there's, there's caveats to this scenario. But I still think that it's pretty impressive to be able to do that in 20,000 row table and just that quickly just filter through and find out what's going on. So, what we have learned, hopefully, is the SQL Server provider enables you to navigate SQL Server like it's a file structure. I'm hoping that it's going to enable you guys to be able to go back to some of your DBAs and say, come on guys, you can start using PowerShell. Maybe, look, it's easy. It's just like using CMD with the file system. We can make use of this. Or, say, DBA tools. This is absolutely what you should be using. It's going to save you guys so much time. It's PowerShell. It's just SMO. You guys know exactly how to go and grab the properties. But if you give your guys these slides, they'll know how to go and get it as well. Don't become the source of help for everybody in your organization about how to use PowerShell. Make them, enable them to help themselves. Okay. As we have seen, SQL Server and PowerShell are, there are plenty of quirks, yeah. If you push the bleeding edge like I did and you go and get the, the module from the gallery the second that it's come out, stuff is not going to work. In my experience, I, in production, I make use of the SQL Server module that comes with SSMS 17. I don't hit these sort of but apart from the, the file system one, which I've known about for years, it's always been the same. Making sure that you navigate to UNC paths by strongly defining that it's a file system type. Outside of that, it's been very, very stable. You can access SSIS, you can access X events. With the latest one, some bugs. It's new. The reason for that, of course, is that the SQL Server team has had a PowerShell member for the last 18 months. Before that, for many years, there was no PowerShell people in SQL Server at all. And the SQL PS module was written by somebody at home on their own time, not on Microsoft time. So we're in a much, as SQL Server professionals, we're in a much, much better situation to use PowerShell with SQL Server. Um, DBA tools is awesome. There needs to be no more said. Oh, normally I've got a really good question slide, but picture, but this just has questions. Questions? Yes, sir. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. Um, I use this the PowerShell provider most for those quick, snappy answers. So, the, so for example, that X event. Why did the availability group fall over? Exactly when did these things happen? Um, that's because it enables me to give that answer quickly and let's face it, I'm lazy. I'd rather get back to, you know, uh, 
reading some, somebody's blogs. No, sorry, doing other more important work for my boss. Yeah. Um, but also being able to, to jump into you know databases. What's the biggest table on that database? You know, um, DBAs get asked questions about databases as if they should be able to answer them off the top of their head. Yeah. How many rows has that table got on that database? Uh, which server? Hang on a minute. Um, I, I'm not going to remember that. And I know a lot of stuff, but I don't. I don't remember that. So for straight provider on the CLI, that's how I would expect it to be used. Um, and then I'd expect guys with PowerShell knowledge and experience to be able to make use of it to enable other people to do stuff. And then if you take the SQL Server provider to include the management objects and doing all that, I say, look at DBA tools. You can do anything you want. You know, we've got 180 odd com commands there and literally anything that we've got. You've got one of those already. You can now have another one to give to your DBA. <laughs> there is another question. Yes, sir. Is there a nice way to handle maintenance plans in PowerShell? Let me give you the question back at yourself. Is there a nice way to handle maintenance plans? No. Um, the answer to the question is no. Uh, the second answer to that question is why would you use maintenance plans? And the reason I say that is that because if you are using a SQL Server or you have <coughs> SQL Server in your estate in any way and you want to make sure that it's backed up, you Google Ola Hallengran and you download his maintenance solution and you press F5 and it will create the store procedures and everything to do everything best practice. It'll create all the jobs, it won't run anything, and then you can set it up. But it means that it'll do things like change the backup type. So if you have a database that's just been created, um, you can't take a log backup until you have taken a full backup. Yeah? So if you are a uh, you're providing a service for your clients, which means that it spins up a new database for them, when are they most likely to want to go back five minutes? Or could I go back to what I did because I've just made a mistake? In the first couple of hours, yeah? If you don't have a full backup, you can't take a log backup, you can't restore the database back to that time. Maintenance solutions not gonna help you because it's either gonna do all databases in which case you're probably going to be do you don't want to be doing your full data backup in the in the middle of the day, so you'll be doing your log backups every 15 minutes, every five minutes, or whatever. But they're going to fail for that database because it doesn't have a full backup. Yep. All a Halligan solution will go. Oh, you want me to do a log backup? Okay, hang on a minute. Log backup for that one. Log backup for that one. Oh, hang on. This database hasn't had a log backup. Hasn't had a full backup, so I can't take a log backup. I'll take a full backup. And then it takes full backup. And then everyone that comes after will be able to be a log backup. That's just one tiny way of how much better this community solution is than the default thing that you get with SQL Server. There are many, many other things. That's a very long way of saying no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but please, sir, have, have one of these. Ola Hallengren. Let me let's let's pull it up and then it'll be on the recording as well. So are we connected to the internet? Probably. Yeah. So we go like that. Ola Hallengren. I'll be actually connected to the internet. There we go. It goes to his website. Have a click, quick click through to his website. Let's see how quick his Wi Fi is going to be. Anyway. 
that's exactly where, where I would recommend that you go and that you recommend to anybody to go. We've managed to load Google, but not all of us. Uh, there we go. Um, if you go to download, it's just going to download one SQL script that you can run, and it'll do everything that's there. Um, Ola works for a Danish bank, um, and his solution is so good that all everybody that you know, that you meet in the SQL world will say, use this. Any more questions? There is a management pack for SCOM that makes use of this. Guess what? DBA tools, we've got as much Ola backup and restore and restore from a file structure that he creates. And anything you can possibly imagine you want to do with Ola Halagrand backups will be, is available in the DBA tools module. Any more for any more? If not, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>